Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve for a special Easter message that explores what it means for the God of the universe to come live inside you, causing the old things to pass away as you move from death to life. Well, it was about a year ago that uh, Tim Wildman, the president of American Family Association, uh, asked me if I would uh, do a radio program on American Family Radio. And uh, after thinking about it and praying about it, uh, I said, okay, I'll, I will do that. And uh, some of you may know about the program. It's on 90.5 FM here in Texarkana. It's a nationwide program called Real Truth for Today. And we just celebrated our first anniversary just a few weeks ago. And uh, it's been fun, and it's a lot of work, but it's been a lot of fun. And on Thursday, I was studying for the message for today, and uh, I got an email from a lady, and she said, hey, we had been talking to this lady back and forth, but she said, hey, uh, would you like to interview Mike Pence uh, for your radio program? And I said, well, that would be pretty cool. And so we worked it out. He was a delightful guy to talk to. And, you know, you, you'd think, what do you, what do you call the guy? I guess I call him Mr., uh, Mr. Former Vice President or whatever. He said, just call me Mike. And so he was calling me, I was calling him Mike. He was calling me Pastor Jeff. And as I got to visit with him, it's like, hey, we have a lot in common. He grew up Catholic. I grew up Catholic. He was one of six kids. I'm one of six kids. He got saved later as a teenager and I got saved later as a teenager. I was a senior in high school. He was a freshman in college. He's been married to his wife for 37 years. I've been married to my wife for 37 years. He's got three kids. I have three kids. I mean, we had all this stuff in common. The one minor thing that we didn't have in common, he served as the vice president of the United States of America. <laughs> and so I, I didn't really have anything there. But uh, the reason I was interviewing him was he has a new book out, an autobiography called uh, So Help Me God, and it is unashamedly his Christian experience in politics, and early on in the book, he shares his, his salvation experience, and Mike said, you know, I grew up Catholic, and uh, similar to the way I grew up, knew about God, all just in my head, not real in my heart, and it was just going through the motions. It was just religion. It was just boring, and he said when he got to college, he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of done with that, but he got introduced to some Christian guys, and he got uh, to know these guys. They befriended him, and uh, so he was asking them questions because he knew there's something different about these guys. And he said one, one thing happened to him that really was uh, life-altering. He said he was talking to his friend John, and John wore a cross around his neck because he was a, a very outspoken Christian. And Mike said to him, hey, John, I need to find out where you got that cross because I need to get one too. And he said John looked at, at him and said, hey, you know what, Mike? You got to wear it on your heart before you wear it on your neck. And Mike said, man, that was like getting hit with a baseball bat because all of a sudden it's like, hey, this facade of being a Christian, uh, this guy sees through me and now I know that, that I'm not a Christian and uh, the Lord's made that clear to me. And he said it wasn't long after that in April that he went to a, uh, a Christian festival that was at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. That's where you've been reading about the revivals. Well, this was in 1978, and he's there, and he said they were, there were bands playing and then someone preaching, and he said, when I heard the message, it was, uh, finally became real to me. And so this is what he writes in his book, So Help Me God. I truly heard the words of John 3:16. All the music stopped and there was an altar call. I stood up and walked down the hill, not just because I was convinced in my mind of the truth of the gospel, but because my heart was broken with gratitude for what Jesus had done for me on the cross. I found a volunteer counselor and prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. It was a moment of decision that changed my life forever. I was born again. The old me was gone. And I felt forgiveness and a newness of life that is difficult to put into words. 
From that day forward, I felt that my life was not my own. I had been bought with a price, and whatever was to come, I would live out my faith in Jesus Christ and follow him wherever he led, no matter the cost. I thought that was an awesome testimony. His life had been changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we come to church at Easter. That is the most highly attended Sunday of the year in our church, in every church around the world. People come on Easter. Now, sometimes they don't come any other time. They just come at Easter, maybe at Christmas, but Easter is the big Sunday. Sometimes you can hear, and pastors will, will kind of uh, gig people for, hey, I hadn't seen you in a year. Uh, I don't do that. I'm glad you're here. We're glad you're here. We want you to come back, and, uh, but thank you for coming. And it's our honor that you're with us. And I know what it's like. You know, you, some people, you come to church at Easter. Why? Because you're eating at Grandma's for lunch. And she told you, no lunch for you, big boy, unless you come to church. And so I've heard people over the years, I've heard it all. They come at Easter and they're very complimentary and they say, oh, the music was so wonderful. Oh, the message was so great. Oh, Pastor Jeff is so handsome. I've heard it all. And, <laughs> but listen, that's, that's wonderful if you say those things. But here's the big, big question on Easter Sunday. Has the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ truly changed your life? What did Mike's friend tell him, Mike Pence's friend? Hey, Mike, if you don't wear the cross on your heart, don't wear it around your neck because it doesn't mean anything. We can talk about the resurrection of Jesus and that's a fact of history, but has that impacted your life? Has that changed your life? Now, how do you know that you're truly a Christian? The way that you know that you're truly a Christian, that you've truly come into a personal relationship with Jesus, is your life changes. My testimony as a 17-year-old high school senior, when I gave my life to Christ, and I didn't understand a lot about what that exactly meant, but my life could not stay the same. Why? Because the God of the universe came to live inside of me. And when the God of the universe comes to live inside of you, he changes you. You're under new management, and the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So has the life-changing gospel really changed your life? I want to share with you three truths for this Easter Sunday morning. Three truths about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Truth number one, the gospel of Jesus Christ is often misunderstood. So many people don't understand what the gospel is. They say, well, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's, uh, that's doing good to the poor. No, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, no, no. The gospel of Jesus Christ is loving your neighbor as yourself. No, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, well, the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is letting your light shine among men. No, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not that those things are bad. Those things are good, but that's not the gospel. Paul defines the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and he says this. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Eongelion in the Greek, it means good news. I make known to you the good news which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I received, delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So how do we understand the gospel? Because the devil is going to try and work to confuse you about the gospel. Understand that Jesus came to earth to die as a sacrifice for sin. That was his purpose for coming. And you say, well, Jesus came to heal the sick. Well, he did that, but that wasn't his purpose for coming. Jesus came to raise the dead. Well, he did that, but that wasn't his purpose for coming. 
Jesus came to cleanse the leper. Well, he did that, but that wasn't his purpose for coming. He claimed to, to feed the multitudes with the little kids' lunch. He did that, but that wasn't his purpose for coming. His purpose for coming, he says in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served. Why did I come? But to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. To give his life on the cross. That was his purpose for coming. In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist. You remember John the Baptist had a huge ministry. Everybody came to John the Baptist. But uh, John the Baptist said, uh, when Jesus came on the scene, he must increase and I must decrease. And he pointed the way to Jesus and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was his purpose, to take away the sin of the world, to die as a sacrifice for your sin, for my sin, for our sin, for the sins of the whole world. So, of first importance is the gospel. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. But he didn't stay dead. He was buried, and then he rose again from the dead. And Jesus rose from the dead and conquered death and hell. Now, it said he did that, rose on the third day. Some people have a real hard time with that, and they say, ah, it doesn't, the math doesn't work. You know, I've, I've added it up, the hours. It doesn't work. You got to remember how the Jews thought. Any part of a day constitutes a day. So Jesus died at 3 p.m. on Friday at the exact time that the priest would slit the throats of the Passover lambs. That's when he died. And he breathed his last and said, it is finished, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died. And they took him off the cross uh, and they put him in the tomb. He was in the tomb before 6 o'clock. Remember, 6 o'clock, their days are not like ours. We mark ours from 12 to 12. They marked theirs from 6 to 6. So that was 6 p.m. is a new day. So Jesus is in the tomb by 5 p.m., which is Friday. He's in the tomb at 6 p.m. all of Saturday. Well, Sunday begins at 6 p.m. on Saturday is Sunday. He's in the tomb on Sunday. He's in the tomb for three days because any part of a day constitutes a day. Well, on Sunday morning, early, he rises from the dead, and he conquered death and hell. Now, John, the uh, gospel writer and the revelator in the book of Revelation, he's exiled on the island of Patmos. The year is about 95 AD, and he sees the resurrected, glorified Jesus. And John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. And this is what Jesus said to him, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. He conquered death. He conquered Hades or hell. He's the only one to have ever done that. You know, there are other people in the Bible who died, and Jesus raised them from the dead. I can think of three. You have Jairus' daughter, the little 12-year-old girl. She was freshly dead. She was still warm to the touch, but she had died. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. Your daughter has died. But Jesus raised her from the dead. The second person he encountered who was dead was the widow from Nain, N-A-I-N, a little town called Nain. And uh, they were having the funeral procession. This guy was cold and dead. And uh, Jesus stopped the funeral procession, touched the, the casket, and boom, he was made alive. Then the third guy, so you have warm and dead, you have cold and dead, and you have Lazarus, he is stinking dead. He's been dead for four days. Jesus raised him from the dead. And all three of those folks died again. Jesus is the only one who died and rose again, and he's alive for evermore, and he has the keys of death and of hell. So we can <laughs> rejoice in that. And so the, where does the gospel go from there? Jesus offers eternal life to all who will repent and believe. That's the gospel. Jesus died for your sins, my sins, our sins. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he offers eternal life forever. In heaven with him, abundant life right here on this earth right now for all those who will simply repent. That means turn from the way you're going and believe. Turn from sin, turn from self, and turn to him and believe. Eternal life is not something you earn. You can't earn it. 
For by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. It's not something you earn. It's something you receive by faith. It says in Acts 4.4, many of those who heard the message believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. Now, I can preach all about the resurrection. I can preach uh, the gospel that Jesus died for you. It's very personal. The promises for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself, Acts chapter 2. And, and it can be personal to you. But the question is, have you personally received it? So many people come to church at, at Easter time, and they've never received it. They wear the cross on their neck, but they don't wear it in their heart. What was the testimony that Brian just gave us when one of the dear ladies, Miss Grayson, who got baptized? She was on a mission trip. She was telling people about Jesus, and she realized, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And she gave her heart to Christ. Hey, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, for indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard it. What is the ingredient that gets you to heaven? What, how do you receive Christ? By faith. By faith. You put your puny little hand of faith in God's great big hand of grace, and he pulls you up from the pit, so to speak, and puts your feet on a rock, making your footsteps firm. So the gospel of Jesus Christ often misunderstood. And how do we get it confused? We think it's related to works. We think we work for it. We're going to earn our way to heaven. No, you won't. If it is by grace, Romans 11, verse 6, for if it is by grace, the unmerited favor of God, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. The moment that you add any works to grace, you destroy the whole concept of grace. It's all of grace, and we put our faith and trust in God's grace. So often misunderstood. Second truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ is always disturbing to the world always disturbing to the world. Now, in the book of Acts, such a great book, you know, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. In seminary, uh, you, you'll take a class that's called Luke Acts, because same author. And uh, Luke tells us what Jesus began to do and teach, and then he tells in the Acts, we call it the Acts of the Apostles, it's the Acts of Jesus through the Apostles, what happened after Jesus ascended to heaven. So Acts chapter 1, Jesus is with the disciples. Remember, he was with them for about 40 days, uh, right at 40 days. And, uh, and he was talking to them and teaching them. And he proved to them, the Bible says, with many convincing proofs that he was really resurrected from the grave. They knew that. I mean, they saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. They talked to him. Remember, Thomas wouldn't believe unless I see uh, the nail prints and put my finger in the nail prints and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And Jesus appeared to Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. And Thomas saw and he said, go ahead, Thomas, put your fingers in my hands. Put your hand in my side. Be not unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Thomas ended up getting killed for his faith in Christ because he knew that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. So many convincing proofs. And Jesus told these guys, listen, you stay in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. And so they were going to wait. He's going to come in just 10 days. And so they waited. Acts chapter 2, what happens? The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. And these guys are filled, 120 believers in that upper room. They are now filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not that the Holy Spirit just came upon them. The Holy Spirit came to live inside of them. And Peter, the same guy who denied Jesus three times, all of a sudden now he stands up and he delivers a sermon that is powerful and is pointed and calls people out and calls people to repentance. And people respond and 3,000 were saved and baptized. And then Acts chapter 3. What do you have? You have Peter and John, and they're going up to the temple to pray at the, at the hour of prayer, which is 3 o'clock. And they go to pray, and there's this beggar there. He's been crippled from his mother's womb. He's 40 years old. And they, just, they would put him there every day. Well, take him to the, the gate called Beautiful and let him beg because he can't do anything else. 
And so he's begging there, and Peter sees him and says, look at us. And so he looks toward Peter and John, and Peter says, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have we give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And this guy who has never walked in his whole life, 40 years old with uh, dead limbs and, and shriveled up muscles, and all of a sudden he takes him by the hand, he raises him up, and his legs are strengthened, and all of a sudden he's walking and leaping and praising God, and that creates a big stir. As you can imagine, this is in the temple area where that happened. And all of a sudden, the people are like, whoa, this is awesome. This is incredible. And Peter says, let me tell you how this happened. It's not through me. It's not through John. It's through the name of Jesus, God's son. And then he preaches the gospel. And he says, you know who Jesus was. He was the one, the Messiah, and you asked for Barabbas instead of Jesus. You traded uh, the son of God for a murderer. And you crucified the prince of life. Man, these are like, wow, that's so pointed. That hurts. But he says, listen, repent therefore and return in order that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. He's preaching all this stuff, preaching the resurrection of Jesus. And then the chief priests and the temple guard and the religious leaders that oversaw what happened at the temple, they got wind of it. Acts chapter 4, verse 1, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came about on the next day that the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. That's the Sanhedrin. And Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? They were greatly disturbed. The good news of Jesus disturbs people. You think about it. Eon Gelion, good news. How many times has good news really disturbed you? Hey, I, I got to tell you something. It is great news. Really? I don't want to hear that. That'll disturb me. I mean, that's just dumb, right? Why do people respond the way they respond to the good news? Because the good news is... Uh, prefaced by the bad news. The good news of a Savior is prefaced by the fact that you are a sinner. And see, here's the thing. This is why it's always disturbing to the world, because people hate to be exposed for their sin and false beliefs. They just hate it. Now, the Sadducees are mentioned here. The chief priests were all Sadducees. You have the two big groups. You have the Pharisees and you have the Sadducees. The Pharisees are, they believe every part of the Old Testament. The Sadducees don't. They just believe the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And they say everything else, we just take it with a grain of salt. We're just the book of Moses. We're the Moses people. But the Pharisees believe all of it. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection and angels, and, and they believe in uh, all the things that we would say we believe in. But the Sadducees didn't. The Sadducees controlled the temple, and they controlled the priesthood, and they were in cahoots with Rome. It was very, very corrupt. Very interesting as you do your study in the Gospels in the book of Acts, you'll find that Jesus had more trouble with the Pharisees and the early church had more trouble with the Sadducees. Why? Because Jesus' ministry was not in Jerusalem primarily. It was primarily in the area of the Galilee up north. Headquarters was Capernaum. You didn't have a lot of high priests there and chief priests. You didn't have a lot of Sadducees there. You had a lot of Pharisees there. But the early church was birthed and born in Jerusalem. That's the realm of the Sadducees. So they have more trouble with the priests and the Sadducees. And Peter is calling these guys out. He's preaching Jesus, the one they condemned to death, the one they said was a blasphemer. He's, he's preaching Jesus, and he's preaching the resurrection of the dead. They don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. 
So they're really getting faced by this teaching. Oh, what are you, you guys are saying this stuff, and then, and then you're saying that Jesus was murdered, and, and you're trying to pin that on us? They get upset. They're getting exposed, and people don't like to be exposed. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 3. And this is the judgment that light is come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifested, shown as having been wrought or done or accomplished in God. Hey, sinners are like roaches. You turn the light on and you have a room that has roaches in it. As soon as the light comes on, they uh, are going to scurry away into the darkness. They don't want to be exposed. And Jesus was the light of the world. And he said, you know, in order to come to him, you have to come to the light. You have to let your sin be exposed. Well, that, the Sadducees didn't want that. The chief priests didn't want that. The religious leaders didn't want that. So many people don't want that. They don't want to be exposed for their sin and false beliefs. And they will often respond violently to the good news of Jesus. It's just insane, but it happens all the time. So in Acts chapter 4, we're going to find out that Peter and John, they get threatened. Speak no more in this name. Acts chapter 5, they're still speaking in the name because they said, whether it's right in the sight of God to obey you or obey God, you be the judge. We cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. Acts chapter 5, they're arrested again. We told you don't speak in that name. And they were going to kill them right there had not one of their uh, leaders, Gamaliel, said, hey, don't do that, guys. That would be bad because if this is not of God, it'll fizzle out on its own. But if it's of God, then you're going to be fine fighting against God. And so they didn't kill him, but they flogged him. Then in Acts chapter 7, you have Stephen, one of the first seven deacons in Acts chapter 6. And Stephen was a powerful witness. And he is arrested, and people bring false charges against him. He preaches a sermon in Acts chapter 7, and he calls the religious leaders out. You men who are stiff-necked, always resisting the Holy Spirit... And it drove those people crazy. They began to gnash their teeth at him. You know what it means to gnash your teeth? That's what dogs do when they're getting ready to bite you. They start growling, and when they growl, they put their teeth together <laughs> like that. That's what goes on in hell. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, Jesus said. Well, they started gnashing their teeth at Stephen. And then they put their hands over their ears so that they wouldn't hear what he had to say. And they rushed upon him and pulled him out of the temple and stoned him to death. The gospel is always disturbing to the world. Why? Because it calls men out and women out and boys out and girls out that they're sinners. And what kind of sinners? Helpless, hopeless sinners. That's the only kind of sinner that there is. And so people want to feel good about this. So well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a self-made man. Look what I've done. I, I really, uh, you know, have a great name in the community, and I'm, I'm moral, and I'm upstanding. You're a sinner on the highway to hell without Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel tells us. It's bad news that leads us to the good news. And people say, well, where do you get off saying that? I'm not getting off anywhere. I didn't write the Bible. I'm just telling you what it says. I'm the delivery boy. Get mad at the author. Don't get mad at me. People get upset. Well, I don't want to believe that. Well, you can believe whatever you want. But there's a way that seems right to a man, and the end thereof is the way of death. It's important to believe the truth. And as we see today, truth is hate to those who hate the truth. And there are many today who hate the truth who hate the true God, who hate the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's often misunderstood. It's always disturbing to the world. And thirdly, the gospel of Jesus Christ is what really matters in life. Someone has well said, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then what really matters? Nothing really matters. 
But if Jesus did rise from the dead, nothing else really matters because God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And when they bring Peter and John and the guy that was crippled for his whole life, they bring him and they put him in the middle of this uh, august assembly, and it's very intimidating. And they ask the question, verse 7, it's just teeing it up for Peter. And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? What authority do you have to do what you're doing? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, now watch this. Jesus had told these guys, and when they arrest you and deliver you up, don't be anxious about what you will say. For the Lord, by his Spirit, will give you the words to say. It's not you who speak, but it's the Holy Spirit who will speak through you. And these are words from the Holy Spirit spoken through Peter. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, can you imagine being on trial for that? How dare you heal that man? If we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. By the name of Jesus Christ. Now remember this. Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. They knew him as Jesus of Nazareth. He is Jesus who is called Christ. Christ means anointed one. It means Messiah. Jesus who is called the Messiah. And it's by the name of Jesus who is called the Messiah whom you guys crucified whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Can you imagine you are an uneducated fisherman? Now, you, you spent three years, three and a half years with the Lord Jesus, so that is a major education, but you have no sheepskin for that. And, and they, they noticed that these guys were uneducated, untrained men. They're like, wow, these guys. You know what untrained means? It says that in verse 30. They noticed they were uneducated, untrained men. Untrained is the word uh, idiotes. We get our word idiot from that. They saw that these guys were idiots because they didn't have the, the training and the schoolwork. And they were amazed. Now, you get in front of all these muckety mucks. And it's intimidating. These are the same guys that condemned Jesus to death. And Peter is the guy when the slave girl said, you're one of his disciples. Oh, no, I'm not. I don't know anything about him. And he cursed and swore and said he didn't even know the man when a little servant girl asked him a question. Now he's before all the the highfalutin elders and rulers of the people, and he stands tall. He stands up as a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he boldly lets them have it. Listen, Christians are called to be bold witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. And we are to be bold witnesses. Those are witnesses who speak up and stand up And as the song says, stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. We speak the truth in love. They were very bold for Jesus Christ. And we're called not only to be bold for Jesus, we're called to make the message crystal clear. Crystal clear. Now, sometimes you have a pastor and he's real careful about, I don't want to say anything that could really ruffle some feathers. I don't want to say something that that somebody could get upset about. So they just kind of tiptoe through the tulips. I have about as much nuance as a sledgehammer, right? I don't tiptoe through the tulips because I want you to know the truth. I don't want you to walk out of this place and just say, I'm not sure what Pastor Jeff meant there. Uh, Maybe he thinks it's okay. We're just okay if we wear the cross on our neck. No. If you don't have the cross on your heart, you're going to die and go to hell because it's all about a personal relationship with Jesus. I want to make that crystal clear. Peter made it crystal clear to the religious elite 
There is salvation in no one else. You don't get to heaven through your Judaism. You don't get to heaven through your religion. There's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, the name of Jesus. That's the only way you get to heaven. Now, George Barna did a survey not too long ago. It was 2021 when this was recorded. It was the people who professed to be Christians, born-again Christians. They said, we're born-again Christians. They're adults under the age of 40. So, 21 to 40, adult. I'm a Christian. I'm an adult. And 60% of them said, you can get to heaven in another way other than Jesus. You can get to heaven through Buddha. You can get to heaven through Muhammad. All those paths lead to Jesus. It doesn't have to be Jesus alone. What does Peter say? Fill with the Holy Spirit. Say about that. There is salvation in no one else. Not Buddha, not Confucius, not Muhammad. All those guys are dead. There's only one who conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he's the only one that can save you. Salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. We need to make the message crystal clear. And here's the thing, and Quinn did a great job with this. Listen, all of us have feet of clay. Every Christian has feet of clay. No one has arrived in the Christian life. I don't stand up here and say, hey, I have it all together. I never make a mistake. I'm just this perfect guy. I'm not. I'm just a guy like you're a guy, and uh, my wife's a, a girl like you're a girl, and, and we're just human beings, right? We struggle with the same things. But here's the difference. A Christian is going to look to Jesus and, and bring all the struggles to Jesus and say, Lord, I need you. As we cried out, as we sang those songs, I need you, Lord. Change me from the inside out. Help me. Help me to respond in a way that's pleasing to you. I don't have what it takes. You have what it takes. That's why Jesus said, what, are you, what do we do? John 15, abide in me. I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Uh, 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 you are the branches. You have to abide in me. And if you abide in me, my life flows through you. If you don't abide in me, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Zip, nada. We need him every second of every hour. And so we don't come to people and say, oh, you know, I'm this high and mighty person. No, we, we come lowly and we say, hey, what it, we were saved, as the song from John Newton, uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Somebody said, what is evangelism? It's one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. And that's what we do. And we point the way to Jesus. Uh, I love the Alistair Begg video where he talks about the, the thief on the cross that, that came to heaven. And they say, well, what are your, uh, why should we let you in? He said, well, did you go to, were you a member of a church? He said, no, I'm not a member of a church. He said, well, uh, did you go, did you, were you baptized? No, I wasn't baptized. Well, um, did you uh, study your Bible? No, I didn't study my Bible. He said, well, what are you doing here? Uh, why should we let you in. He said, the guy in the center cross, he said, I could come. He said, I could come. And that's what Jesus says to you and me. Hey, if you'll put your faith and trust in me, you can come and you can be a part of my family and I will redeem you and I will save you. And so Christians are called to make the message crystal clear and we're called to be faithful until death. Hey, we live in a world today especially in America, where you stand up for truth and you're going to get shot at. You're going to get, you saw the, the swimmer, can't remember her first name, Riley is her last name. She was being attacked by the transgender folks because she said, hey, women's sports need to be with biological women. We don't need to include biological men. And she had to hide in a room on the campus of the University of San Francisco because they were threatening to kill her. Hey, truth is hate to those who hate the truth. And, and it's going to be harder and harder for us to stand up for the truth. And we're going to find out who's genuine and who is not. You know what happened to Peter 
The guy that stood up to the Sanhedrin, he was crucified upside down some years later. You know what happened to James? Peter, James, and John, James, the brother of John, he got his head cut off. Uh, you know what happened to Paul? He got his head cut off. You know what happened to Thomas? He got run through with a spear and burned in an oven. Matthew was killed with an ax. Bartholomew was beaten until the skin was ripped off his back, and then he was crucified. Philip was crucified. Andrew was crucified. John was the only one who died of natural causes, but the church historians say that John was boiled in oil and didn't die. Then he was exiled on the island of Patmos. He get, got released from there. He's the only one that lived out his days. All the rest died. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Now, John had a disciple named Polycarp and Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. Smyrna is the church where the Lord says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation was written in 95 A.D. In 155 A.D., Polycarp was arrested. And the magistrate said, Polycarp, all you have to do is deny Christ. Just deny uh, Jesus and the resurrection and we'll let you go. You're an old man. We don't want to kill you. And Polycarp famously said, for 86 years I have served him and he has never done me wrong. I cannot deny my king. And they strapped him to a cross or to a, to a stake and they lit him on fire and they were frustrated because he wasn't burning, so they ran him through with swords. He died. He was faithful until death, and God gave him the crown of life. Listen, I don't know where you are today, but I know at Easter time, lots of people come. They have the cross on their neck, but they don't have a cross in their heart. We don't want you to leave this place without knowing for certain that you belong to Jesus Christ. And how do you know? Your life is changed. You can't be the same anymore. As we close out today, I want to ask you, do you know for certain that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Listen, if you're not sure about that, just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost, and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you're a God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is making a difference in your life through this broadcast, to know that you just prayed that prayer. Please contact us. Let us know what's going on. We want to pray for you. We want to help you. You are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you.